Okay, so for the recording purposes, we're doing the Texas Revolution. We've gone on PowerPoint. Students have done doctors A and B, and now we're doing doctors C, D, and E. We didn't do the thesis though. So based on documents A and B, so for our documents C, D, and E, do you think your interpretation changes if the additional evidence? John's not in his head, he thinks it does. What do you all think out there in online land? Does the document change, or does your interpretation of the event change as more evidence is introduced to it? Andrew says yes. Anyone else? I don't know about change so much as like just kind of becomes reaffirmed or filled out a little more, my initial impression. It depends how much you know about it, right? Yeah. Okay. Document C. When is document C written? About 10 years before the actual revolution, wasn't it? So what's going on in 1826 in Tejas? Mexican officials are trying to station judges in Texas to prevent the Texans from following their own laws. Okay, so it's the time period where you see intense American immigration into Texas, right? Legal immigration into Texas. So as these immigrants come into Texas, there's starting to be conflict. They're not following the laws according to this, right? I always have to laugh about this because people say, well, you should be simulate and follow the laws of the country you're in, always for the United States. Well, here's Americans going into Mexico. They have to become Amer Mexican citizens. They have to follow the laws of the country they move into. But they're given a pass. We hear people talk about immigration today. When we talk about immigration in the past, oh, it's different when it's Americans immigrating. They weren't following the laws. They may have been swearing to be Mexican citizens, but they weren't following the laws. They were bringing slaves in which was against the law. They were supposed to become Catholic. They weren't doing it which was against the law. So there, of course, they were supposed to be simulating, and they didn't want to simulate. So we see people talking about immigration today. Oh, a simulator else. Okay, what about back here then? Well, it didn't matter then. It's too bad. It's past. It doesn't count. The Americans, you know, they're different. So my, it's just attitude, and, you know, perspective. So document D is written in 1836. Who wrote this document? Oh. D. D. A New Jersey born leader of the revolution. And who's he writing to? Senator of the U.S., Henry Clay. Who was a well known expansionist. <laughs> okay. He was one of the original war hawks for the War of 1812. Henry's been in a while. So, what's he saying? Basically, just thrashing the Mexicans and saying that they're better than them. Oh, so people say that the, the Texans weren't racist. What's this letter saying? Contradicting. Uh -huh. A little contradiction in evidence there. Primary source. And this is 1836. So, what's going to happen later on is by the time Texas becomes a state, Many of the Tejano leaders are being forced out of Texas and are losing their lands and property because the Texans are writing laws that they can't they can't stop. And they're writing the laws and they're designing them to defranchise, de-establish the Tejanos and give it to the Anglos instead. It's not about equality. It's about inequality. And the letter, Burnett letter, shows you that series about some one of the leaders. Well, if it's one, were there others? And we see once the revolution ends, we start to see a change take place. Juan Sigan, what he driven out of Texas, 
and have to live in northern Mexico, and he'll actually lead raids into Texas and cattle and stuff into former lands of his own family. Okay, we get the document E, the Lundy pamphlet. What is this document, and when is it written? Just before the or 1836, so. so it's uh, so. during the revolution, right? What's Lundy claiming? That they just want to expand slavery. All right. Now he's making that claim in 1836. What piece of evidence kind of suggests he's right? What happens when Texas becomes a state? Or it doesn't really matter when Texas gains his independence, what happens? Yeah. Slavery is legal. Slavery is legal in Texas upon independence. All right. But Lundy is an abolitionist, correct? So wouldn't Lundy's position be one of extremism as well in this day and age? Not ours, but in his day and age. And, and we say abolition. What is an abolitionist? Or was an abolitionist? Person who wanted slavery abolished. When? During the, or before the, or the Civil War. No. How did he want slavery? How did an abolitionist want slavery to end yesterday? Last week, even. Maybe even a couple years ago. They want slavery to end immediately with no recompense to the slave owners. So they want slavery to boom, done, gone. Many people took the position that if slavery was going to end, it would be done over time, like New York State. They gave a certain period of time. A lot of New Yorkers who had slaves then sold their slaves south before the time period ended, which really angered a lot of people. New Jersey, there were people who was it's like a grandfather clause. So if somebody was enslaved by a certain date, then they were still a slave and didn't stop. There were actually a few slaves in New Jersey at the time of the revolution. I think more on paper or anything else. But anyway, so an abolitionist was you know, considered radical at this time period because they wanted slavery done immediately and they didn't care about the consequences. They wanted it finished. So we've got to understand how people saw the abolitionists. Uh, there'll be a charge that the abolitionists gained power in the 1861 election. That is utterly false. As a matter of fact, if you've ever watched the movie Team of Rivals, about Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln becomes president because of abolition. Not because Lincoln was an abolitionist. He was not an abolitionist. Lincoln said multiple times that he had no power to end slavery. Even the Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery. It just freed slaves who were still being held by the Confederates who refused to surrender. If you were a slave in Tennessee, you were still a slave. If you were a slave in Missouri, you were still a slave. The 13th Amendment in slavery, Lincoln pushed for that to happen, but the, he recognized that the Emancipation Proclamation was a war measure and not the end of slavery, although it was definitely a nail in his top. So, abolitionists, there's a guy named Seward, all right, and Seward will be the Secretary of State during the American Civil War. He was one of the candidates for president. But uh, William Seward's name, he'll be the one who buys ten, uh, last. So Seward, he'll actually have his throat cut the day, night that Lincoln is assassinated. There was a conspiracy, and the guy who was supposed to kill the vice president didn't do it. But the guy who was supposed to kill Seward did try to kill him and cut his throat. And he was out of action for a little bit. The other one, of course, shot Lincoln in the head. So Seward was an abolitionist. When they meet in Chicago in 1860 for the Republican National Convention, remember, it's only the second one they've ever had, they meet in this building called the Wigwam. And Lincoln is not really a candidate for president. Four other men are. One of them's from Missouri. Uh, Blaine was his name. And one by one, they get picked off. And one of them, Seward, 
he was considered the front runner for the nomination. They all thought that Seward would win the nomination. And it turns out he doesn't because there's no backing. You know, there's not enough backing for any one person. And Lincoln's, uh, Lincoln's followers, the guys who wanted Lincoln to become president, they started championing Lincoln as an alternative to these other guys, including Seward, who was like, free the slaves immediately. He was an abolitionist. But Lincoln, of course, was not. He said, I can't get rid of slavery on my own. I, can't, I don't have that power. He said, I don't like slavery, but I can't get rid of it. You have to make that decision. Of course, civil war happened instead. So Lincoln, one by one, these followers start to switch their voting towards Lincoln. And over several ballots, Lincoln becomes the Republican nominee for president. Now, this day and age is different than today's day and age. Today's day and age, you wouldn't have multiple nominations for president, all this other stuff. Back in this day, they didn't have primaries. Those don't come along until later in the Gilded Age, progressive era. So American politics has changed since the time of Lincoln. So Lundy is considered to be an extremist. That's why I'm talking about abolitionists. Even when Lincoln's elected, it's such a radical position that most Americans are not in favor of abolition. They are in favor of ending slavery. And I say most Americans, I'm in the North. But there's not a rad the radical end slavery now stuff does not have the support. And there's a few abolitionist senators, a few abolitionist representatives, but by themselves, they had no power. They could talk, they could influence, but making actually making decisions that were bad binding, they didn't have the power to do it. And Seward, the reason, I mean, that's one of the reasons why he did not become president of the United States. Even though he was a powerful leader, he just didn't have it. And the reason why we talk about team arrivals, all four of those guys will become members of Lincoln's cabinet. He will have them as cabinet leaders, Secretary of State, uh, Attorney General of the United States, General Chase, or no, he was Secretary of Treasury. There's another was Attorney General and the Secretary of War of uh, Standing. One, I think there's a fifth guy who really didn't count, but he'll become the Postmaster General. So this is the team of rivals that Lincoln puts together for his cabinet. He uses these people, which is kind of novel. Most of the time, something like it happened, it won't do it. It's like uh, back in 76, Gerald Ford narrowly defeats Ronald Reagan for the Republican nomination. He then offers Reagan the vice presidency. Reagan goes, no, nah, I got a better chance of beating you in 1980. I'll wait. <laughs> so I'll take my chance in 1980. And of course, Reagan becomes president of the United States and wins a big re-election. Okay, so yeah, which Reagan really defied things. I mean, if you ever study that, Reagan got more votes the second time, not the first time. That's really rare for a president to do that. So now let's come up with an idea of why, going back to our central question here, all right, why did the Texans revolt against the Mexican government? So if you're at home, type it in. John, you can make your statement. He's the only person in class today. In total, like, in total? Or yeah, in total. total. What's, what's the deal here? What's, why, why did Texas revolt? Mexico wasn't the United States. That's actually a valid one. <laughs> John says because Texas wasn't the United States, Mexico wasn't the United States. That's actually a good point. <laughs> that's that's kind of good. So all of you all get the thing. Andrew says the colonists were greedy, wanted their own government. Yeah, well, validity there. And again, we're only dipping our toe in the documents. There are thousands of documents out there. And this is why I say this doesn't get caught in Texas. The uh, abolitionist part and the racism part gets downplayed. And uh, if you don't promote pro-Texas uh, class stuff in your classes in Texas, you're not allowed to teach them. You get fired. Texas. Which explains why I'm not in Texas. Now, if you go out here and you try to tell somebody in Texas that the Texans uh, succeeded and slavery is one of the issues, they will blow up most of the time if they don't know their history. It's not really good barbecue, though. Hmm? It's not really good barbecue, though. Yeah, well, that has a different term when you go to Reconstruction. 
they uh, would burn people alive and then lynch them at the same time and then, then sell the body parts off. It was not the the 1890s were not a pleasant time for Black Americans, which is one of the reasons why uh, then the um, uh, the war will start in NAACP because of one of those uh, a feeble minded man who was murdered more or less by a mob mentality. And then parts of his hands, his knuckle bones are being displayed in a store in Milan and Georgia. And he sees that and he says, We got to do something. And that's why the NAACP came down. Now, everybody talks about history being nasty. I think re reconstruction history is probably some of the most sickening history in America, which is interesting because Colfax just put a new memorial of Colfax uh, massacre. And uh, it's definitely not what. Uh, it was presented as for about a period. It definitely tells a different story. And there's the story about getting rid of the old memorials. And there's a lot of stuff out there. A lot of interesting history going on and changing what uh, has been misrepresented because the white people of Louisiana betrayed the uh, takeover of New Orleans from the uh, state government as a uh, patriotic, democratic thing. But it was anything but. In fact, you have little murders going on and rebellions and stuff like that. Andrew's the only one who's typed one in. Come on, folks, let's get some ideas here. Okay, Alex. American slave owners in Texas expressed the Mexican government wanted to be a new slave state. Okay, there's the validity of that too. Slavery wasn't the only reason. There was there was more. Santa Ana, number one reason is Santa Ana. All right. Bottom line, Santa Ana is seen as the number one reason. Uh, you read all the stuff. The Tejanos revolted right along with the Anglos, and they did not really care about the slavery issue as much as they were upset with the idea of Santa Ana repudiating the Constitution. They saw him as a dictator, and they saw, saw themselves as freedom fighters. So that's that's a big reason right from there. But if you go to the Anglo side, you will find stuff about slavery, and you'll find this part here, like the Burnett letter, where they didn't like the Tejanos either. Yep, Zachary gets that one right. So there's multiple things in there. Now, as the Lundy people points out, it's going to expand slavery. And as we know from history, that's exactly what did take place. Had Texas not been a slave state, well, then we're looking at a different type of history, aren't we? But we don't have that history. We have what did take place. This is where you get a contingency. But when they downplay the role of slavery, as I always go point out, go look at the laws of the Republic of Texas. Did it have slavery as a legal law of the land? The answer is yes. So when they try to downplay slavery, I say, okay, is that different than what you had under the Mexican Constitution? The answer is definitely yes. So there you go. There, there is something to be said for that. Well, I would say that it's not the number one reason. It is a reason. It's part of the, the litany. Uh, as far as not trusting the Mexican government because it's not white, there's a big validity to that too. Again, the last two don't get a lot of attention. In fact, let's see, just get the feel good story about the rebellion. And then there's the great state of, you know, great nation of Texas. Unfortunately, Texas was so poor, it borrowed money, it was massively in debt. So when Texas is annexed by the United States, it's annexed with a couple of provisions. One, the Constitution guarantee, you know, has the thing about states becoming um, people of the area becoming a state. Texas has the ability to break into five different states because it's so big. They, they, they give it the ability to break into five different states. And they paid, the United States paid Texas's debt off, which had accumulated a sizable debt. Nothing about, you know, not quite as bad as the United States. You have to understand this in context. Under Andrew Jackson, 
the United States reached for the only time in its history zero money owed to anyone else. And then the panic of 1837 happened, and we haven't seen that number since. So the United States reached the point where it had paid all of its debt off at a black, we would call it black figure in the balance book instead of the red figure it's had for years. Uh, it actually had no debt, which was a big thing. And had the United States taken Mexico under its wing, it would have had to pay, uh, it would have gone into debt. Well, it does that anyway, because the panic of 1837 and all the problems come with it. So just think about it, 1836, 1844, eight years later, that debt of Texas is not seen as negative by the people of the United States who are wanting to annex Texas. And they do. And they do pay off Texas's debt. And it's not a small debt. It's a fairly decent sized one. So the United States goes into more debt taking in Texas. That, that tells you something right there. I want people to say 9 million or 15 million, but anyway, again, that's, you know, we're like, that's nothing, but it is in 1836, 1844, but it's quite a bit. Okay, so there you go, there's Texas coming into the United States. It becomes a nation of, it was a nation of its own, it's the only state that can make that claim about some, uh, dubious facts being used, such as Vermont or California. California declared itself to be a republic, then found out that it had been picked up by the U.S. anyway, so they were, okay, never mind. So, yeah, if it was a separate country, it was never recognized by anybody. The Americans grabbed it immediately, so took care of that. Vermont's a whole another story. If you get involved with people in Vermont, you'll get a whole history lesson on that one. <laughs> so, it's a, it's a fun one. Then, of course, Kentucky and Tennessee flirted with it for a little bit, and then the United States put the hammer on that. There you go. That's the Texas story. Again, on Wednesday, make sure you have your ticket assignment done for how did newspapers cover the attack on Fort Sumter. It's an interesting article. Also, we have three class days left. Make sure you go to the grade book, look to see where you have zeros, start filling them in, get stuff turned in, because the end of the semester is fast approaching. If you have questions, I'll answer. If not, have a good day.